Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 144. Why dividend growth vesting is the best. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just getting started, Dividend Talk is the place to be for insights, analysis, and unsalted advice on how to make the most of your money through dividends with our own unique European flavor. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and join our community on Facebook at Dividend Talk. See you on the inside. Hey, European DJ. How are you, buddy? I'm really, really, uh, how's it? Really, really energized because it's already, you know, half April almost. Spring is fully up in the air. And today we have a full pack show. And actually about a topic which is really interesting because we have never spoken about this. It's oh. probably obvious having a Dividend Talk podcast, but we never, ever took such a foundational topic so i'm really really uh yeah energized by this one how about you yeah me too hey the, the sun is shining over here we're, we're finally getting a bit of sunshine that brings out a good mood in in everybody um we've had we've had a horrible horrible march um so i'm looking forward to some sunshine getting out there getting outside again it's 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 all good and hey this is quite a landmark moment on the show actually because i think you've got a special announcement to make Yes, definitely. Da, 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 da. We are launching our first official web shop with Dividend Talk merchandise. Can you imagine? This means we're in the top of the mountain. We made it. We can officially say that that we're there. You know, we're Finfluencers or whatever it is now. We have a side hustle. No, all jokes aside, um, we just thought generally that it's really, really fun. For our listeners to be able to wear something like a hoodie or a t-shirt that kind of uh, shows your passion for investing so we thought about some really nice quotes that are typically also passing by on social media or especially here in the dividend talk uh, uh, podcast so you know you will find the link to the to the web shop in the description of this um, uh, podcast Full disclosure, we make a 25% uh, profit on this, on, on whatever you buy. It will be all reinvested in the, into the podcast, to the software we buy and everything that we have. If some money is left, we will make sure we'll fund the ticket for Derek uh, coming to Poland uh, here. Uh, but look, think about quotes like, you can't borrow conviction or a bit spicy one maybe, controversial, but if you want to go to your bank you could buy you could wear one with bankers are wankers i'm sure they will be happy to receive you there but others like you know from drip one of our uh, persons that we engage a lot with like stick to dividends boys and girls really like when we're talking about option trading or something like that or the this is your classic one derek buy the dip yeah <laughs> so we have some really nice ones there in the web shop check it out if you feel that there's an iconic thing that we typically say here is missing send us a message put it on facebook or twitter it's really easy for us to quickly design one and add one and then we'll, you will have your special tailored hoodie however you want uh, how you prefer it uh, at your doorsteps awesome yeah it's quite it's quite exciting um and i have to say you've put in a lot of work behind the scenes to, to get it up and launched so thank you for that but i'm, I'm excited I'm, I'm going to order one straight away and i'll start wearing them showing showing them off on my youtube channel just show the world show them our nice merchandise one. i definitely also go for one and uh there's uh there's some really really nice ones i i honestly like the you can't borrow conviction i think that's one that i can really wear private but I need to have a bankers are wankers. I really need to have one just because it's me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I definitely think I'll have to get to stick to dividends, boys and girls, because it's a bit of a joke in work. They know, they know I do the podcast. They know I do this and, and they'll be asking about companies and I just look at them and they go, 
uh, they don't pay dividends and they just laugh they just laugh so um, ah nice one i definitely going to wear that print into work that's that's what I'm... so what about actual news this week other than promoting some of our stuff quite shamelessly there <laughs> Well, well, generally speaking, right, um, I'm not call, calling out a particular news article, but the narrative this week in the media uh, that I saw is like, oh, the dollar is dead. Yeah, that, that kind of narrative at the moment, like uh, Russia selling a lot of oil to China, the Huan, Chinese Huan is becoming more and more as a currency being used in the world. So, you know, there's a bit of word about this. And also the US dollar is now back at one. Uh, what is it? One dollar and ten per euro, which is good for us because last year we were buying stocks for for uh, dollar parity, and now we buy again ten percent more of American stock, right, uh, for the same euro. So it's pretty good. I I did see somewhere someone mentioning, well, this doesn't apply for the Swedish crown. I I realize that it's also a bit the same with the zloty, but at least from a euro point of view, this is really good news. Yeah, just ten percent is a lot. Uh, on every ten shares you buy, you get one additional now again, compared yeah. to where it was like just half a year ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we we spoke about that before. It it kind of ebbs and flows. You never know where it's going to be. And we tend, well, I tend to try not worry about it. I don't look at it too much, but it'll take from you in one sense and give from you in in the other. So. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll but do you it. think that the the US dollar is now officially in a path that it really becomes weaker and weaker? Like that, it would be the end of the dollar as as what it was before, as how we knew it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's a lot of things happening macroeconomically as well, isn't there? Around this new currency, BRICS. I, I think Brazil, mm -hmm. Russia, India, China, and South Africa. If I if I I'm saying that correctly. So they are all coming together to try and come up with their own currency to trade. I see Brazil were out today encouraging other third world countries and, and second world countries. Maybe they should come away from the dollar. So there's a lot of talk and a lot of movement around de-dollarization at the moment. And I think it will happen. I think it's inevitable. Every every dominant country falls at some point, but it looks like there's moves being made. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I really don't understand how it will affect it. It, it just obviously will, I would say. And it, it's interesting to see France as well jumping, flip flopping between the US and, and China. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. they're playing, they're playing a, a game there. But it's, um, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see with with the US dollar. But I think it's going to come under some pressure, particularly with with the other countries now making it their main goal to come away from from the dollar yeah for me it's mainly geopolitics and uh, we'll see how that plays out and i think yeah. the dollar is a result of that um, but it's clear what china is doing at the moment it's very clear and you know like you say empires come to an end i don't think it's coming to an end anytime soon to be honest uh, america for me the, uh, the ingenuity in this country the 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 science i know politically it sounds uh, sometimes like it's getting more stupid but if you look at r d and everything what comes out of america it's again open ai right that comes out of america also the wave of ai and we've been only hearing like china is so strong in ai but then you know this chat gpt comes from the states yes so I, I still see this as uh, um, a technological superpower. The United States far, far more be than Europe, and still far ahead of China. So uh, yes, China is not anymore just the manufacturing place of the world alone. They upgraded themselves definitely over the last few decades. So it's normal that it gets stronger. But I can't see United States within the next 20, 30 years suddenly disappearing unless they have their own civil war internally, but not, not, not on another level. So with that having said, I feel very comfortable with my um, American stocks in my portfolio. Very comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Well, and from that perspective, I'm not selling my American stocks based on based on any any of that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, but that's the only reason why we should worry, right? Yeah, if, of course. If, if, if otherwise, we would we shouldn't care about this at all. And it's the narrative. We see these narratives all the time popping up and going away. And it's like almost like there are spin doctors behind it or something like that, right? So, I mean, if anyone was scared about this, 
I'm personally not at all, and uh, otherwise just call me naive. But if I if I get to get this kind of shit all the time in my head, uh, I wouldn't be a disciplined investor. Yeah, it's 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 too hard. Like looking at the macroeconomics, as you said, it's always in the news. There's always tensions between China, America. You can see even now, there's Taiwan was back in the news, and there's always tensions there, and it will have it will influence us at some point. But while it's just speculation, I don't think it can influence you because otherwise you'll be buying and selling every second day. Okay. Um, actually, there has been some companies report earnings um, already. So um, Louis Vuitton was one of them. Uh, I know we haven't looked or covered that, but they posted some quite strong results, which is, I mean, I, I find it so, so crazy. I, I don't know what it's like. Well, I do know what it's like in, in Europe, but like in Ireland, the price of everything has gone through the roof. You can't go down the street without talking to someone and they mention how expensive everything is getting. But then you see Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton which is a luxury brand selling goods at above average prices. And they raised their revenues by 17% year over year. In yeah, this I, I don't understand where people get the money from. Yeah, because what I can only can tell you is that the liquidity became less or let's say more tight just because of all of uh, the inflation. So are people buying this on debt on their credit card or what? I, I really don't don't get it. It, it, it feels for me really anti-pattern. You would expect that uh, grocery uh, chains like Aldo has are doing better because people cannot afford anymore to go all the time out for dinner now because of inflation right but this seems to be like uh you know it's, it's almost like wolf of wall street party uh, in society like like cash is splashing against the walls everywhere and, and and you think of the narrative that you've just spoke about like it's all negative going into recession wars currency de-dollarization all this is happening china has been in lockdown in the last two years so they are not yeah. even contributing to this much at all and yet they're still growing year over year yeah. by double digit numbers i mean it's it's just incredible it's incredible what yeah. they're doing. it shows uh, that we have some really strong european companies here and there's also one question about this right about louis vuitton versus uh, hermes and such and our thoughts about it uh, I believe from uh, Wolf of Harcourt, who we had once as a guest on the show here. So let's take that question now and whether we ever considered investing in that. Yeah, of course. Of course, uh, of course we do. But have, have you seen <laughs> the valuations? And this is my issue here with these kinds of companies. I mean, they're, they're also hiking nicely, of course, the dividends. But for me, they always feel too expensive. And I don't understand the brands. I mean, I'm not a guy with a Louis Vuitton bag, yeah. So I also don't have this feeling for the products. I mean, they always look expensive, but they're always pushing out results like 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 I've just spoke about. It's just it's so hard. I I feel I I feel like we will never get the opportunity to get these at a fair value because if something was to happen to drive them down, in my mind, it's going to be something big. And it's probably yeah. going to be something that they can't recover from and we, we lose out. But I, I would love to, particularly Louis, Louis Vuitton, I would love to own these guys. But it's just it's just hard. It's yeah. just too hard to, to spend that amount of money on, on that company. Yeah, and I think I might own something in, in a pie somewhere on Trading 212. <laughs> but I, I don't consider those as holdings. Uh, it's for me kind of more like an ETF uh, position. Yeah, yeah, similar. <laughs> Um, dividend hikes. I don't think there's been too many to talk about other than Procter yeah. and Gamble with a 3%, 3 dividend. Yeah, many, many people on uh, social media found it kind of a bummer, like like 3%. And I'm thinking like, oh my my God, man, they, they did 67th year of consecutive dividend hikes. I mean, give them a break, please. Yeah, they've been hiking uh, like crazy over the last years, 3%. I actually like it when a company is a bit more conservative if they see uh, like clouds uh, in front of them. So, I mean, I, I I take these kinds of, I don't have a position in Procter & Gamble, but look at Unilever. It has not yeah. been hiking it at all. Yeah. So I think it's it's quite decent. We had other stocks that were doing double-digit uh, hikes over the, over the last year. 
I mean, they have paid 133 consecutive years of dividends. Yeah, so this is really one of those iconic dividend kings, and you should just go on your knees and knees and and kneel for them when 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 you see this company because it's a it's a king. It's really the king. Yeah, but in in, in saying that, I, I get what you're saying about three percent, but I would think three percent is a little bit disappointing. Let's look at Johnson and Johnson, for example. What yeah. what what do you reckon they're going to raise? Usually five six percent is is, is the uh, it will be all the time the same i think six percent or something like that uh, but there's an interesting thought process because they are also spinning off the consumer business so will they now break the six percent trend there's a question like will there be a small dividend cut because what you know if they spin it off there will be maybe less cash flow so actually the the dividend hike is coming up for johnson johnson probably next week or the week after Monday, so i expect it yeah yeah. So, what do you think? Uh, what What do you really think? Uh, taking the consumer health, uh, consumer health business also into consideration. So, so I, I was thinking about this, and I honestly think it's going to be a low, low dividend increase. I'm saying it's going to go up to what are they one thirteen at the moment uh, per quarter. I think it's going to go to one fifteen, which is like a one point two seven percent in the yeah. um, dividend hike. I think it's going to be small. I really do. Yeah, I yeah. still think they will do a six percent, uh, and why? the consumer business is probably 10 to 15 percent of cash flow yeah so they might go from i don't know payout ratio from 55 percent maybe to 65 percent now and their drugs are growing the predictions are good so i think they will just stay with the clockwise uh, uh dividend hikes yeah. i i think so i mean sometimes i wonder uh, i worry about actually a company of johnson johnson because general electric was doing the same but then i read the book about general electric and they were just every quarter quickly shifting some money to make the numbers like clockwork right but you could almost say it's fraud yeah it was just too complex the business for uh, auditors to figure out what they were doing but just on the last day of the quarter quickly selling uh, for 200 million a small business or something like that to make the earnings look good yeah, as clockwork so sometimes i wonder like how how is a company like johnson johnson which is quite a diverse business not so showing really a lot of diversity uh, in 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 the in the in, in the earnings and in the specifically the dividends, right? You would expect like a, a tough year and then a bit more a lower hike, but over on average, but they are doing it like clockwork. So it's almost too too good to be true. We we should probably see a little bit more of that now that when they spin off and the consumer health is not there, that consistent 10, 15, 20 percent of their cash flows is gone. And yeah. are purely a biotech company, we will probably start to see a little bit yeah. more, a um, little bit yeah. more volatility there. But yeah, it'll be interesting. Like it's it's really a really intriguing one. This one, I believe. Part of me wants to believe they're going to stick with the five six percent, but I I just think I think with the spin off, I I think we're primed for them to have a synthetic dividend cut where they will cut it in line with with the cash flow. So we'll, we'll see. Now they they, they right. might they might raise it to a little bit and then and then cut it when they spin off again and we'll be back to the same level. I, I don't know, but I I think it's going to be small. Okay, cool. So below four percent, I take a vodka shot. About four percent, you take a vodka shot in the next show and after the announcement. Yes, yes, sounds like a deal. Good. The only real vodcast uh, <laughs> that we have here. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, why is dividend growth investing the best we have as you said well, we've never, never spoke about this before I, I can give you full disclosure i'm i'm really really not biased so everything i say here is without <laughs> any bias yeah i, I want to be totally clear here that the listeners don't think that i am i don't know biased about dividend investing or dividend growth investing or have any any involvement in it or something like that no I really feel like I can speak objective. Uh, so, so one. your name then is European investor. That that's your name. No, no, it's dividend growth <laughs> investor. It's just catchy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. I'm 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 the biggest hypocrite uh, in the in the European dividend growth investing community. But look, uh, because I'm so unbiased, um, there are just few bullet points that actually necessarily don't directly are about dividend growth investing right so why if you ask me why this investing strategy is the best you know 
what I really like about this strategy is that you need to find companies that can consistently grow their dividends. Now, what companies can do this? These are companies with a strong moat. Yeah, so what, what Bar Barn Buffett uh, uh, calls like companies with uh, strong barriers uh, in the market that, that, that are hard to entry. For instance, strong patents uh, for many, many years or economies of scale, like think about Adult Del has. Uh, you cannot just build such a super chain, a supermarket chain in two years or something like that. Yeah, so these are really strong established companies typically and they have pricing power. This pricing power allows them often also to hike their prices for their products or services above the rate of inflation. Yeah. And, and because of these kinds of things uh, here and their proven track record over time uh, of earnings growth and such sets it really, really up as strong, strong, I, I said, high quality companies that grow over time. That's what I really, that's why I really, in its essence, really think why dividend growth investing is the best strategy because the dividends are a result of this growth. And I, yeah, I mean, I think if you think about long-term investing, uh, like, like people think about Buffett and such, uh, uh, yeah, and Buffett always says like, it's not about the dividends here and, and this and this, but the end, if you look at this dividend income that they have as Berkshire Hathaway, I mean, what can we say, yeah, so. But that's for for me the top reason. There's a few other reasons that I will mention soon. But uh, what is for you the top reason uh, why it's the best strategy? So for me, without doubt, it's it's because it's relatively hands off. I don't have to pay, and I I can't. I, I don't have the time, but I don't have to follow the market every day. In actual fact, I don't really know what's going on with the market from day to day most most times. Uh, the market can go up it can go down there's lots of different news that can scare you and can and can throw you off i can ignore pretty much all of that all i need to worry about is look at an annual report or look at the quarterly earnings what is their cash flow what is their earnings can they afford my dividend and that's really all you have to worry about it's 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 pretty much as hands off as you can get outside of etf investing which i cannot do and i, I think i've spoke about that before if mm -hmm. If it was a possibility when I was starting this journey that ETF was more accessible in Ireland, I would probably not have stumbled on this path. But yeah. as an investment in Ireland, I think it's so hands off. It really suits my lifestyle. I don't have to worry about it. And like you said, just just take it back from from investing. All these companies, all your dividend kings, your dividend aristocrats. If you don't know anything about investing, you walk outside your door. I see companies like Sanofi, I see companies like West Pharma, I see companies like Tesco in, in the UK. Three of them companies are really, really consistent dividend payers. I know the businesses, I know what they do because they're close to me, I can understand them. And there's just huge businesses that will not disappear yeah. anytime soon. And I think there's comfort in that. Yeah, and, and those are usually industry leaders, like uh, top one, two in their markets. And, you know, if you think about it, I've got a few million of employees working on a daily basis in my subsi subsidiaries, right? So, I mean, and they're every day they're working. And when there is, for instance, a plan down, they wake up in the night, they get a call and they fix it so that our passive income, our cash flow continues to ripple in. I mean, I don't know if they realize, but they're working for us. Yeah, continuously, highly motivated top-notch employees best in the world i mean what do you want more yeah be your be your own boss is what they say and and as you said i would love to actually i might do that might look at all my companies see how many employees they have and then see how many employees i have i must be close to a billion uh, i i don't know but also look at the the contractors that they have an whole ecosystem that thrives out of those companies right so, I mean, th this is really, really nice. And for me, it's one of the most passive forms of investing, as you say, because for many of these stocks in our portfolio, we need to check from time to time if the dividend is safe. I mean, you mentioned quarterly. I think we're a bit fanboys here also with the podcast, but honestly, for most of the stocks, you only need to look once a year. Yeah. And if something with one of the companies happens during that year, 
I mean, if you have 50 companies, it happens maybe to one or two something that requires your attention outside of the annual report on a yearly basis. So, I mean, it, it is really also a low maintenance portfolio from that point of view. We make it a bit more high maintenance, but uh, because of our passion, but it's generally low maintenance portfolio. The only thing is always like the research, right? The initial research that really consumes the time. Yeah, it, it is. But but like I said, a lot of these companies are companies that everybody will know. Coca Cola, for example, you don't need too much research into knowing what they do. You're really yeah. looking at the numbers there. That's that's pretty yeah. much it. It's not it's not like these growth companies like uh, I don't know, uh, or is it D Dog or or something? I, I don't they, even know. Say that dog or Data 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 Data. Snowflake or Snow Dog or S Palantir. C Limited and stuff. So you, 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 yeah, there's a lot more research than new companies. Like, and you have to try and understand their business models, what they're doing, how they're making money, who their consumers are. Are they going to be? Are they even going to be around in ten years' time? Whereas I can, yeah. I can definitely say to you, Coca Cola will be here in ten years' time. Johnson Johnson. Yeah. Will be here ten years time. Texas Instruments yeah. will be here in ten years time. So I, I find yes, there is research, but I don't think as much research is needed as it is with like younger yeah. startup, smaller and, grow companies. And this also um, reduces the amount of speculation that you're doing versus investing, right? And that's also really um, what I really like about it. And and for instance, you know what is maybe what we actually don't really discuss about ever in this show, but because of the um, the dividend growth that you need, which is a result of cash flow growth and earnings growth, you have a lot of potential for capital appreciation at the same time. Because if your capital wouldn't appreciate, but your dividend would be hiking, your your, your yield would, would really increase as well. And usually this goes a bit in lockstep as well. So also from a total return uh, point of view, um, you, you get this as well, right? So you also see your portfolio value growing over time um, if yeah. you invest in these kinds of companies. Yeah, I think that's the mis biggest misconception out there. That everyone talks about these huge, and, and look, you can hit a home run with a, with a growth company. You can maybe hit a 30, 40, 50%, even, even 100% returns that you might not see in your typical dividend mature growth com company. But I mean, if you're earning twenty percent uh, on your capital appreciation, and then you're earning six percent raise every year on top of that, it adds up quite quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I can see it in my holdings as well, right? Um, and then you only need like maybe one out of five of those holdings that do a bit better than the rest, and they will pull up your whole portfolio with that as well. If you're interested in the total portfolio value. What I also really like about uh, and why dividend growth investing is just the best strategy you don't need to sell shares to to how is it to live of income so it's not like the four percent rule where you need to sell shares and and touch your capital um when, when you need the income yeah if you want to live off your portfolio no your portfolio is spitting out the income for you directly on your bank account account so you don't need to sell shares. You don't care then if it's at the bottom of the market or the top, which we even never know whether it's a bottom of a top or a top. Yeah, I, I mean, on, on that point, for me, it makes it easier to calculate my retirement. Okay, Every, yeah. everyone everyone knows, okay, that the market earns S&P 500 earns, I don't know, on average, maybe 8%, 6%, yeah. whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. But you're not guaranteed to get that investing in specific companies yeah. single co companies yeah. it's, it's riskier but at least with dividend growth investing i can say okay on average i know i'm going to get around 67 percent dividend growth year on year i'm investing x amount at a portfolio yield which is around four to five percent at the moment yeah so i can more easily predict my future yeah. cash flows and what i'm going to do with it and when i can actually retire when you're basing on share price fluctuation what are you going to do in, in the likes of 2020 yeah. you're, you're waiting 10 years okay i've been compounding i've been compounding compounding yeah. 2020 happens and half your half your net worth is gone but think about why why do you invest in its purest essence in its purest essence you want to do in the future something with this money yes 
this money is what we call income if you sell your shares after 30 years you do this because you have a purpose for this it makes no sense to only do it to to build the capital for for when you die to give it back to the tax office or the government if you do it you you want to give the wealth to your 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 kids as an example but then why because your kids will want to do something with this money so in the end investing you do it for income generation now we do it more for monthly income to pay the bills others maybe want to pay a house buy a house with it or whatever but in the end you do it for income and this is where dividend is also really dividend investing is again so nice because the income is coming out of your holdings already as an interest payment let's say uh, for holding the shares and yeah this this is for me just i i mean there's just no better investment strategy. I, I mean, I mentioned already, I'm not even biased. <laughs> Purely not biased. Actually, uh, Simply Dividends have a nice blog article on this. They give five reasons why, with a lot more maths and science behind it, including total returns, which we haven't even touched on. We, we know that dividends make up a huge portion of the total return of the S&P 500, particularly when invested reinvested yeah. and we haven't even spoke about reinvesting dividends and what that can do to compounding your results as well yeah yeah but i i see it now right uh, i i can see what what my projected annual dividend income is and if i would need to save this on a, on an annual basis it is quite some salaries right uh, maybe already uh, let's say half a year or more of investments almost six or seven months and and this is now just what i get from my portfolio as a yield yeah so and I, it's all reinvested i mean yeah yeah, yeah I, I can see it in the numbers i because i have in my portfolio sheet i have a stat i've got got kind of the cash deployed to my brokerage account and then i see the amount of dividends received uh, over a lifetime and then the total portfolio value and i can see that the dividends received and reinvested actually therefore is already quite a significant amount of my um capital no i would say portfolio appreciation yeah uh, i mean when you when you look at it from that perspective i can start to see that already my, my i i started out as you know investing a thousand a month it's slightly above that now mm -hmm. but i'm due to earn four thousand euro this year from that that's four extra months of yeah money that i can reinvest into my portfolio i mean that's that's compounding that's 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 compound and others will say like i oh, uh, if you put in a growth stock it grows with the same amount or something like that right uh, and they find dividends uh, a, um, a waste maybe they are right and you know if this dividend re uh, irrelevance uh, theory as well and i think we spoke about uh, about it one time but you know if you're an early stage company yeah you need all the cash but it's at the moment when you're a blue chip company where well, you can put it on the balance sheet yeah and then have it doing nothing at a almost zero percent yield or well, you just give it to your shareholders yeah give, give it to me that's just give it yeah to me. exactly yeah and, and and so for me to conclude really um i mean all of this in my opinion is better than pure growth investing because that's for me also more speculation uh, we mentioned already stable businesses big brands are easier to understand typically business models are easily easier to grasp volunteers not easy to grasp as an example um so there's also for me a little bit less risk involved at least perception of risk let's say like that yeah um yeah and i mean i don't even want to talk about investing in gold or bitcoin or any of this stuff because for me that's just speculation and let's not even start about trading which i don't call investing just like looking at a few lines on the screen and and betting whether it goes up on down up or down and i guess some people are really good in that i be do believe that that technical analysis has a place I, I i really believe in math and patterns and 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 these kinds of things but if i see sometimes those people sitting behind the screen and i see addiction and then i'm rather just addicted to uh, dividends coming in yeah you're kind of sacrificing your life a little bit you're in front of a screen the whole time yeah. I, I, know, I know i did a small bit of in my days as a sports uh, trading 
person. But yeah, I, I, I echo what you're saying. For me, the only thing that would come close to this is ETF investing. That's the only one that I would say can rival dividend growth investing. Yeah, true, true. So I, I think we made a, a solid case. Uh, if people uh, want to challenge us, they can try. But I mean, it's not even worth our time to respond to that. So to our listeners, as we said, we are unbiased, but we're also not open for feedback. Dividend growth investing is just the best. It will stay the best <laughs> and we will not change our minds. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. On, on that note, we will go and review a portfolio that we got from Casper. Um, I'll just give some commentary. He's, he sent in a bit of text about, about his portfolio just to give some context. And there are 37 companies in the portfolio with a starting yield of 4%. Top five positions allocation is 28%. Top 10 is 45%. He's 37 years old and he lives in good old Ireland. Um, and oh. like me, there's no ETFs because he knows the pain of this deemed disposal rule that we have over here. Um, started investing back in 2018. He switched to dividend growth investing because of our dear friend, Ian Lopuk. He came across his amazing channel and started his his journey along the way so i'm just going to call out these top five six maybe seven companies there are some good companies throughout this whole list by the way um but i'll just go to, uh, in order number one johnson johnson number two abvi number three microsoft you i already know what you're going to say <laughs> number four texas instruments number five t-row price and number six british american tobacco so what am I going to say? I mean, this is a quality portfolio. I mean, it's littered with top quality names. If you have Johnson & Johnson at 8.3% as your largest holding, then salute. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, he's got a good mix. He's got a good diversification mix. He's got a good sector mix. He's got yeah. high yielders. He's got low yielders. He's got compounders. Uh, I, I really like this portfolio. I really do. Yeah, it's a really nice composed uh, portfolio. I also like something like, I mean, it's uh, in the second half of his portfolio, like General Mills, yeah, canned food. I mean, th th this this business is as boring as it can get, and it is it is a slow compounder. But these stocks are just really really good. Look, uh, there are some things in there because. I mean, I'm a bit allergic to this, but I see Bank of America in there, GP Morgan, also Western Union. I know uh, Chago, um, who was once on the podcast, he is uh, looking at this as a cigarette butt, but I, I wouldn't take it in my portfolio. Um, so there are a few of those those that I, I don't like, but um, he, has, he has quite some financials in there like he mentioned like tiro and then also now nn group so i think he has a pretty decent portfolio but i would get rid of those banks but again as always i'm entirely not biased yeah i, I mean i don't mind the banks here the banks he actually has are, are if you're going to pick american banks they would probably be the two or three Ross fargo with yeah. the eight credit cards per person and the major fraud <laughs> Wells Fargo, pretty much Bank of America. You would J.P. Morgan. You would is is Wells Fargo there? I can't see him. I thought I saw them. Maybe, maybe yeah. Not. Maybe I I don't see him, but I see Bank of America. I see J.P. Morgan, Western no. Union. Uh, no, Wells I, Fargo's not in there. My 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 bad. Um, what I what I do see is Smurfit Kappa, the little little Irish company, the packaging company. I I do like that as well. Um, I went for Snoco at the time, but. He stuck to his Irish roots. Went with a good Irish company, you know. But but honestly, I think it's I think it's a really well laid out portfolio. There's Visa in there. There's uh, Disney. I don't know if he bought Disney as a dividend company at the time. They mm -hmm. are now reinstating the dividend. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a really good really good portfolio. Well done. Yeah. Good. So Kasper, uh, and he excused himself for uh, not being so active, and he just created a, a Twitter account just to you know do this because uh, i guess he's like a social media introvert but he's been following us since june 2020 and listened to all the shows so kasper uh, i mean 
thank you so much it's it's really an honor to to hear that 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 you have been listening so much and you've got an awesome portfolio well done cool so we have quite some questions to get through so we will this could be a long one we'll, we'll do our best let's do it in a rapid uh, mode we, we, we'll see some of them deserve yeah. a little bit of attention so yeah we, true. We, we'll see um so we'll start off with an, with an easy question um, what cars do you drive and how do you think on the personal finance regarding cars so first of all i'm not a car boy um for me a car is uh, a vehicle that needs to get me from a to b um and the good thing about it is you can do this with multiple people it's a bit hard to take my wife on the on the bike together with my two kids i mean i could put my wife on the front of the steer and then my son probably uh between the saddle and my wife and my daughter on the on the back probably but you know it takes a bit of effort and if it's uh, like like more than five kilometers it's also a bit far so there's a benefit in having a car but i bought my car in uh, 2012 and it's a hyundai uh gray as boring as hell it was cheap uh it's a family car and it has now 130,000 kilometers and i want to drive it until the end so that's simply it um and i i hate paying for this stuff because yeah that's me i'm i'm frugal in this space i try to avoid any expenses on this stuff i i am the exact same you've seen my car it's a skoda octavia um i've had that car about two years now paid in cash I don't like to spend a lot of money so it was relatively small money for that car before that we had an opal which we had for about 10 11 years and we just drive them into the ground that's that's what I, so i'm hoping to have this car for another eight nine years and then buy another car <laughs> for small money I, I i don't really care about cars yeah. um I, everything you see you see where i live everything is quite close yeah. i can walk most places if i yeah. need my, my workplace is close my parents are close yeah. all my friends and family are close so we only need it when it's raining which evidently is quite a lot but <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and, and like you i don't uh i never took a loan for a car no yeah. I, I i did my very first car yeah. i was 18 um i took yeah. a loan and i learned i learned the hard way because we hit the global uh mm. recession at that time and yeah. I, I struggled quite badly so i had a high paying job that got yeah. cut and that yeah. was the lesson i needed actually i yeah. was never ever taken out a loan for a car again ever yeah yeah good 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 interesting question because it's a lot about personal finance uh here yeah uh ron kingpin uh good morning dividend investing peeps can you define what a full position is for your specific situation so full position for me is depending on the tier system if you're a tier one company it means you are four percent of my envisioned target uh portfolio size um there so if it would be let's say a million yeah it would be 40k uh in this case four percent but also in 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 conjunction with the yields of a what is it the 3.25 percent yield or something like that on average yeah. so sometimes it will be a little bit less or a little bit more because i actually try to do the four percent on the dividend income more than on the portfolio size or said the position size yeah uh, mine's roughly around five percent i don't want any position more than five i do have some as as you're building up positions but mm -hmm. by and large uh, i don't want to have anything more than five percent of my portfolio yeah and okay. then the next question is from joris evelines marse and he he is asking which stock to buy mercedes aston martin or ferrari so I was looking at Aston Martin and I don't think they pay a dividend. So they mm -hmm. were they were gone straight away. So then it's between Mercedes and Ferrari. And just on dividend history only, they're both very I would say errat not erratic, but they, they don't consistently grow their dividends and they are prone to cutting them. But I think Mercedes has a slightly better history i'm going off kaifen i'm just looking at kaifen yeah. off both of them um mercedes would just edge it over ferrari 
and in Formula One, I think I prefer a Mercedes as well, which is quite controversial. So I'm going to stick with Mercedes. I would go for Ferrari because they have the best ticker symbol in the world, and that's race, R-A-C-E. So that already deserves my money. Secondly, talk about a car with pricing power. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody wants to. Yeah, if, if, if you ask me which car would I rather own, a Ferrari or a Mercedes, it's a Ferrari all day long. A red Ferrari, that's everyone's dream. Exactly, exactly. So I would I would go for Ferrari, yep. head of a fist. Good. Then uh, Chinedu Onoyne uh, is saying, hey, love the show. What do you think about ticker symbol VLGEA? Now, VLGEA is, uh, what was it again? The, I forgot the exact name, but the supermarket chain. It's a supermarket chain, if, if I remember yeah. correctly. I, I'm, I'm not too familiar with them. I know they had a high enough yield. Um, yeah. So... I mean, I, I looked at, uh, first of all, I looked just at the dividend history and they've been paying since 2015 at 25 cents per quarter in dividend. Never raised it. So for me, that's already a red flag. I think they're a 4.6% yield. And that's the reason why I'm not even looking further. I looked a little bit on their website and, and, and such. And it came across as a as kind of a family business. Um, already existing for i don't know 80 or 90 years so it's it's not a, a young business um i believe mostly in the east coast in america um very um community oriented so you know looks looks okay but you know if it doesn't grow the dividend since 2015 then it makes no sense for me yeah i mean look it is it is a small cap company and, and looking at the financials it looks relatively Good. Everything is growing like it should. There's very little depth on it. Um, dividends are well covered. Uh, I think it's around 30 or 40 percent payout ratio they have. But as you said, the dividend history has been flat from 2013. And I don't know. I don't only have history as far as 2013. I, I don't know if it's been flat before that. So no, no, they didn't pay a dividend before. Only in okay. the 90s or something like that. Yeah. So it's 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 pretty flat. So you're not getting much growth there so it's a 4.61 percent yield um which is pretty flat so then you're really uh, to grow your money you're really looking at capital appreciation there yeah and and, and reinvesting dividends but and reinvesting dividends and so so by the way the for full disclosure the the name is village supermarket uh i, I just quickly reminded myself of the name ticker symbol vlgea um the same person is also asking about zim and cib ticker symbols um, I believe you can say a thing or two about that. Yeah, Zim, Zim is a shipping company that was quite popular, but I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe they are now looking at reducing that dividend or even cutting it all together. And they had some oh. pretty high yields over time. And if, if you bought them in the high 60s, their share price has been decimated. Their, their earnings is quite cyclical as well so I, I would just say be careful on that one it's easy to get caught up in that high yield but it can go just yeah. just as quick and and there was talks of that and um, from some people who would know that company much 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 better than i would um cib is another one it's a high yielding company 8.55 percent ban columbia they are called and um, they seem to be like a financial institution maybe some sort of bank um looking at the screener that i usually use it looks a little bit more all over the place compared to um village supermarket that we were talking about so i would i would definitely just just at first glance i would i would ignore a company like this i think the attraction here is probably the yield but i think in the financial sector there are some pretty good yielding companies out there that would be better suited than this i'm, I'm thinking of someone like legal in general I'm thinking of NN, ASR, um, there's plenty, there's, there's more T-Row price, there's, there's lots more out there with high yeah. yield that I would definitely lean towards more than a company like this. Nice, nice, nice. Good. Stanley James has asked us your thoughts on the best ETF for the S&P 500, which also gives a dividend and why. Yeah, and... I'm going to give a ticker symbol, which I believe is not accessible to Europeans uh, because I've never really looked into this. 
um, from that point of view, right? Because I mainly look at dividend ETFs, but I would go for ticker symbol VOO because they have a 0 0.03% uh, um, uh, cost uh, factor. And uh, I said, but I don't know the exact yield at the moment. I believe over last year it was like um, an income return of 1.4%. So it's not a high yielder. But for me, if I look at this one, I mean, it, it is, of course, tracking the S&P 500. So that's what you get. But for me, that seems to be the highest uh, or the best one. It's from Vanguard. I would typically go for Vanguard one uh, when it comes to S&P 500. Yeah, you had a YouTube video, I think, on dividend ETFs. Obviously. Yeah, but, but this is a question about S&P 500, right? Yeah, so sure. I'm not talking about dividend ETF. Okay, um, Daniel has asked us uh, quite a morbid question. Can you talk about tax from the US stocks when we die? How is, in your opinion, do we prepare for it, split the account, etc.? Yeah, so there is, uh, first of all, we are all subject to this uh, tax, right? This was 60% or something like that. Uh, when you die, that uh, should go to the American government. Um, uh, however, in practice, I mean, they don't know you right so uh, legally you should uh, submit it yeah tax form and then they will harvest most of your uh, uh, portfolio let's say but what i will tell my wife is just like sell everything uh, otherwise or you know just have, uh, keep the portfolio and just don't mention anything because the american government will not know yeah so um that's how i would look at it from that point of view yeah, I'm the same. I, I I would just tell my wife to log in, sell everything, put it into a bank yeah. account, and do whatever she wants with. Does your wife know how to log in? Because mine not. I mean, I will be just screwed. And it is something that I was thinking about, but I just got didn't got to it to sit down to it to yeah. just explain her everything one time, write it down for her because we had someone passing away in our family, and. I, I was the only one that knew that this person had a small portfolio and I wanted to get the money uh, out and I really had to almost hack the computer almost via, you know, the, the password reminders, everything. I could kind of uh, backtrace how to log in. Um, but it was an issue because it was a kind of a Forex broker, but uh, the headquarter was in Greece, so I couldn't really easily access the money. They didn't accept our legal documents from uh, Poland because they expect something more like according to the Greek uh, regulation. It took me six, seven weeks with threatening with police and everything uh, there uh, via email to, to get the money. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is the issue with these international brokers. Think about interactive brokers or think about the hero. If, if your spouse, she needs to prove that you are married, yeah, as an example. And then in this case, if you're, let's say, with interactive brokers might not be in Ireland, do they accept the documents and such? These practical things we run into um, here. Yeah, my, my wife might not know how to log in, but my sons would, so she'll be, she'll be okay. Once there's, once there's one of the two boys around, yeah. she'll, be, she'll be okay. But, but it's a, it's a... I need to fix this, yeah? And I'm thinking just by adding her name to the thing. So in interactive brokers, you can do this. Yes. my wife my wife's name is added there but on the hero i don't i don't believe so no oh, interesting i might actually look at doing that myself on interactive brokers okay um cohen has asked us where did you guys learn your financial knowledge so some of it at university um there i had, I had some semester of accounting and financial management although i didn't do anything with it for five six years so and you know within four years you lose almost all your knowledge the only benefit i had is when i started reading about this i quickly grasped from concepts and i could then find it back in the books that i had from university um, but you know the typical books about buffett and uh, financial statements and such that's where I mostly got it from but even peter lynch with one up on wall street that just simply explains i believe what the pack ratio is yeah um 
yeah, that's where I usually got it. And for the rest, it's just an accumulation of, you know, you you read the annual report, you don't understand what's written there. You start Googling, you look up the accounting material and you learn. You ask questions on social media about it as well. Yeah, pr pretty much, pretty much the same. Just reading books, some books. I spoke about how to read financial statements, one by Warren Buffett. I'm reading at the moment, the little book of valuation by Aswat Damaron. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm about a quarter way through but it's a fantastic little book um but you just as you say you pick up things as as you go along um yeah books twitter youtube and annual reports financial statements and then talking in general talking to people because you you learn not even talking listening more <laughs> yeah. like listening to people you, you you learn quite a bit so i've been blessed with this community we always yeah. have these times where we jump on um around intel earnings i don't know if we're going to do yeah. intel anymore but yeah. Um, we've met some really knowledgeable people who has passed on a lot of information yeah. so it's good. And, and even between us right when we were wondering about okay goodwill a lot of goodwill on the balance sheet but how bad is it actually i believe alexander asked us this one time as well right and you know and then you start really reconsidering like hmm how bad is it actually and you start then reading and then you form your your opinion again so my opinion is often just changing yeah i, I would call it maturing uh, over time and i think this is also important that when you're in this learning process actually never stop being curious and and, and thinking about what people ask and such because they are often not asking to challenge but to make us better investors as well right and genuine questions so yeah i agree um Mateus has asked us he is currently searching for stocks in the healthcare sector which are fairly valued um with a good CAGR fair PE and growth not the large players but rather small players and he's come across this company in Hungary which is called Gaydon Richter what are your thoughts Gaydon uh, uh, Gideon Gaydon <laughs> I mean <laughs> Uh, look, I, I, I look briefly into it, right? And um, it's a mid pharma company. It's their strategy as well. It has 200 products, I believe. They have also some over the counter um, generics. Um, it looks like a solid company, to be honest. Um, based in Budapest uh, as well. Um, I actually don't know what the ticker symbol is. Um, it is Richter, R I C H T E R. Okay, that's the that's the full ticker symbol. Okay, yeah. okay, good. Um, so generally looks um, looks looks good, but yeah, how I said with when it comes to pharma stocks, I prefer big pharma because of the portfolio management, and this is a little bit outside of my comfort zone. So I, I really can't say anything I believe useful to you, Matthias. I think you found a very interesting company to study further and I I think it might be something I'm just wondering with such a mid pharma like how much pricing power do they have with their drugs and such because when I looked at some of the drugs like cardiovascular they're in quite competitive market uh, I saw they have a lot of generics and such so uh, yeah what I didn't like they had a 50% increase in sales in russia uh, as well so russia was one of their growth factors and it's a little bit in my uh how i say it um, in my uh, sin stock where i don't like it category yeah they, they seem to be quite diverse and particularly in a lot of women's needs as well is is one of the big players they've had some medical devices so they seem quite diverse within the medical space financially they look pretty sound i must say and um, they look like they have a decent balance sheet revenues are increasing and growing free cash flow is nicely going what i could not work out is what their dividend policy was and i know you looked online as well to try and find it, it wasn't quite yeah. clear um their dividend per share there's no real logic to it it's it's yo-yoing up and down i tried to find a trend with free cash flow and net income it doesn't match either so i don't know it, it looks like they just wake up and think i'm going to pay 20 percent this year 40 percent next year and, and pick a random number um so from a dividend perspective it is in an upward 
trajectory, but it's too erratic for me. And honestly, investing in Hungary is probably not going to be where my competence lays either. So I, I would avoid it. But certainly if you know the area, know the region, looks has all the hallmarks of a, of a good company, I have to say, F- financially and even some of the metrics that from a PE ratio um, and some of our 10-year, 5-year CAG are total returns as well. So yeah. It seems like a, a pretty nice find. It's just outside my circle of competence as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the next one is Adam Bacon. And if you have such a last name, then I hope he's not vegan or vegetarian. <laughs> it's uh, almost impo- impossible. But he's asking us about uh, if we can give our opinion about the current stage of in the cycle of the cyclical stocks, like, for instance, oil and gas or materials, Shell or Rio Tinto. Uh, he's considering starting a position, but unsure if now is a good time. Of course, we never give financial advice but we do have opinions and thoughts yeah um i yeah for me it's in the top of the cycle specifically the oil and gas if 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 you're looking if you're looking at cycles what's what's probably better at the moment is financials and real estate investment trusts they seem to be getting put under a lot of pressure Mm -hmm. whereas you have energy um i haven't been following materials so i don't don't really know but you have energy that are quite well quite at the top and i would expect i mean Look, I would expect them not to stay there forever. Um, they will come in waves. Um, I just think there is better opportunities out there. I, I, I don't. Yeah, want to, I don't. I don't want to put you off investing in these companies if if you don't have them because they are. You get a decent yield, particularly for Rio Tinto. You get some good growth yeah. in terms of dividend growth of Shell, um, but in terms of capital appreciation, you could probably lose a little bit. Yeah. Um, as well so I, I would say like the cycle is typically if you want to know when you're in a downtrend you turn on cnbc and they're all the time talking about the dollar price and 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 such and how how companies can still be profitable this this it will be the conversation of the day you will see lots of red numbers you will see suddenly the price to earnings shooting up um there because now it's probably four or five but that's that doesn't mean it's valuable it's actually peak profit uh, typically so these are the kinds of things you can look at and specifically if you are on social media and you hear everyone saying on twitter oil is dead then you know you're in this season where it's uh, in the lower end of the cycle bottom fishing makes no sense uh, here because you don't really know but this narrative is 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 what i'm looking for to yeah. to see if we're at the bottom of a cycle yeah. And, and the narrative we have now is every financial every financial institution is going out of business and every read is going to go out of business as well because of interest rates and, and so on so exactly that's that that's where we're at and i think that's for me where the opportunity lies and and what i'm struggling with is actually every time i want to go and buy something i feel like i'm buying financial stocks the whole time i, I feel like I'm, I'm going overweight on them but that's where the opportunity. But two years is. ago, we had this with consumer staples. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so half of me is oh, I'm buying too much, but then half of me is like, next year I could be buying too much technology. Next year I could be buying too much energy again. So we'll we'll see. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Para Evers has asked us our thoughts on Medtronic. Um, I know it's a company you wrote about before, and it's yeah, it's a company that. I've always felt was overpriced, but looking at it now, it's it's down around the eighty dollar mark. It looks quite competitive. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I bought some not too long ago. I think around low seventy or seventy five. Uh, a small, small few. I mean, Metronic. Let's say like that, an iconic company. Yeah, effectively uh, saved many people's life with the invention of the pacemaker. Yeah. Um, he says it had a couple of rough years, but is now yielding about three percent the the it's just the, the the fact that it's yielding about three percent is just a, a matter of price stock price nothing else the company uh, struggles to grow its cash flow that's the real real issue with this company there's a new ceo in and i'm still not convinced i think this this business is it is in a very saturated market lots of competition from striker and and and, and all these companies and i i still i i don't see a, a clear growth factor for metronic yes if i go to the slides of the ceo there's a lot of mentioning of what the strategy is and everything 
but in the Medtronic case, it is a bit seeing is believing. So for me, uh, the dividend history speaks for itself, but everything can come to an end. But generally, in my mind, without uh, uh, now having the latest quarterly earnings in front of me, in my mind, I always think like, well, in the in the at, at, let's say the low 70s, that's usually for me to nibble a little bit in, but not like load up the truck. Uh, yeah, yeah, and 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 to maybe give some validation to your point there, the, the free cash flow over the last 12 months is 4.16 billion, which is roughly around the same as 2016. So there's been zero growth in, in that time. Mm -hmm. I know it's been yeah. up and down slightly, and the dividend payout ratio looks quite high from a boat and earnings. 80 or something like that, 80%, yeah, remember? Yeah, just, just, just a rough value looking at it, the dividends is 3.5 billion. And with a four point yeah, one there you go. billion, yeah, it's it's quite high. So I can't see this eight percent dividend increase that they've been doing over the last five years continue yeah. continuing at, at that rate. But definitely, definitely, as you said, an iconic company, and coming around a fair value. But the question is, how safe is the dividend, or how how can they keep growing the dividend? Is is the question? Yeah. I must say I'm quite proud that I all did this top of mind uh, without any tool behind it. Just from remembering last time, like three months ago, reading the latest update on Metronic for myself. So now so I'm getting older, but some stuff sticks still in my mind. <laughs> it's sticking in there. It's sticking yeah. in there. Um, Marek has asked us, how similar are your portfolios? I mean, how many of the same stocks do you have? I would say quite a few. Yeah, but also not so similar because always when I look at your portfolio, it, it is quite differently composed, right, mm. uh, than mine. And I think it has to do with the, the how long we have our portfolio. That's why I have Microsoft and Apple in there because they were at a certain moment at really low PEs. Like I bought Apple at a 13 PE at the time. So you don't have those stocks in the top of your portfolio, right? So. We, we do have different compositions here. You have also an interest in different stocks often than I have. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but but you can you can definitely see in terms of when we talk about cycles, we know we do have some similarities there. Like we have a lot of yeah, oils, true, Shell, true. and then we've a lot of financials that are coming yeah. into play as well. But different different parts of the journey. Obviously, we have the Johnson Johnsons and Hodel Hazes. Yeah, uh, but who, who who hasn't? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But uh, you're right. I do have a part of my portfolio for high yielding CEFs in investment trusts and, and so on, which yeah. is something you don't have. You have more of a a, a position in growth that I don't have. Um, mm -hmm. So they are are quite quite different. Yeah. Okay, um, Elo has asked us a question. Uh, this looks long, so I'll, I'll try to read it as, as quickly as I can. Um, it's a practical question. Like us, he has a busy lifestyle at work and stuff that does not leave much time for the markets. His question is, how do you practically buy stocks every month? Do you just log in at random and buy whatever has hit your levels, or how do you do it? So... Um... And, and he, he also mentioned something about uh, placing orders, right? And waiting until it gets triggered. And he cannot do that. That is probably because he doesn't have a margin account. And with the hero and interactive brokers, you have this uh, margin uh, typically behind it. So that's why I can do it. But look, honestly, I know whether... So I follow the markets a little bit, right? It's more like I've got my uh, wish list in my allocation strategy of the stocks that I want to have, I've got uh, one or two formulas uh, there, which says like, okay, if it's above 2.75 yield, uh, it, it, it flashes a little bit the color. And then I know like, uh, okay, I can look at this one. I, if I know that I didn't buy anything uh, in the month, I look at those companies. Usually there are like uh, four or five in that wish list that are in the right color. And then I check like, oh, which one I haven't bought yet for a long time uh, or which one I could buy a bit more of. And then I check when did I last check it in my notes. And then if it was like a week ago and the price I see and I just buy it. Yeah. And that really doesn't cost a lot of time. Really, really not. It's more like for me to remember, oh, I didn't buy, buy anything yet this month. So I need to buy something now. Yeah. I, I'm just saying I can log in on the weekend. Like if I log in Saturday, Sunday, place an order, it could get hit Monday. It could get hit. It could get it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I never do a market order uh, because you you never know how the how the algorithms work. Um, but but I I do work with limit orders for that reason, and sometimes they don't get triggered. But then on the Monday, I would just you know edit the limit order and then maybe take a market order because at that time there's enough trading volume. Yeah. Okay. Um. Second part of this question is how do you think when positions are starting to grow? Let's say a position is 20, 30, or 40 K. He knows that it's the same percentage spread over X number of stocks, but looking at the high number makes me doubt the decision. I, I mean, if I would have positions with 40,000 uh, euro, I, I, would be, I would be already far retired. Yeah. So for me, this is not, this is not achievable, not realistic, these values. 20k maybe yes um uh, in time but i'm not even there yet but i understand the i understand the the question what i've noticed that my perception to to these numbers changes while my portfolio grows yeah now now there can be a day that i'm i'm suddenly losing 2000 euros on a single day yeah just because of how the stock market responds and if you just uh, if, if I were just thinking about that for for just a minute, that's a lot of lot of lot of money. You know, with two thousand, you can really do a lot with a family of four over here in Poland. But the whole perception is changing when your portfolio grows, right? And when you trust it, when you have trust in your portfolio. So, I, I actually don't think that it will be ever an issue for me if I see how I've been responding from when it was like five thousand euro portfolio to where it is now. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting question, and I completely understand it. Um, in my investing journey, I'm not quite there like you, but I would have had something similar when I was trading. As as you go up and you're you're, you're trading larger amounts, um, and you're buying and laying uh, is what you're doing to make a decent return. You could be turning over forty, fifty k in a race. It doesn't mean you're spending fifty k, but you mm. you are turning it over, and you had to. It certainly took a while to psychologically build up to that level. But what I will say is that once you have a plan, once once you know the risk and you're comfortable with the risk, that's how I was able to overcome that. I, I understood the risk. I at most was five percent at, at risk, and I was comfortable with that. It seems like if you're doubting your decision, you might be a little bit uncomfortable with the amount of risk that you're taking. That's probably what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. just get comfortable get comfortable with risk and you'll forget about the the digits on the screen um paul has asked us we saw what happened with russian stocks after the invasion of ukraine how safe do you consider your chinese holdings after the recent taiwan exercises alibaba i'm sure this is yeah I, I, we spoke about it in the news of the week kind of right with the dollar um i mean i've got one holding there uh, i do have a lot of companies with uh, sales in China, yeah, whether it's biotech or Unilever, um, yeah, I mean, I can't influence this geopolitics, and it, I, I, I wouldn't be able to avoid China exposure with dividend growth investing because Johnson Johnson, all these companies have a business in China as well. So, yeah, uh, I don't own any Chinese stock, so. No, but you, you, you do own companies with Chinese sales. Yeah, that's true. Although the pandemic has probably slowed that down as much as they're not as reliant on China as as they are most of them. Yeah, yeah, it depends. But for instance, I own some Starbucks. Yeah. Then biotech is really really often depending on China. So Unilever, these kinds of companies. So it has been the growth market for many companies over the years, right? Uh, due to globalization, there was not so much innovation, more globalization. Mm. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. There's a lot of a lot of stuff in the news in, in relation to that, but I try yeah. and I try and avoid block that out because it would drive me mad. <laughs> but, yeah, because you you'd be worried about all sorts, but. Yeah. Many mystery is asking us about calculating intrinsic value, right? Via the discounted cash flow model. 
and he's looking at um, do we do anything with maintenance capex and 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 deducting that from the the operational uh, cash flow. Um, you know, because if it's if it's a continuous thing, then uh, maybe you need to do something with that, right? So many usually it's not the first thing I look at. I try to keep it consistent in my approach, like uh, uh, operational cash flow just minus uh, capex, like the entire capex. Although I do follow the footnotes many, and if something there is where, like to your point, that for instance, um, I said the the maintenance capex is really in there. I usually tend to go to the more conservative side um, rather than keeping an eye closed. I think keeping an eye closed is usually what sets me up for failure. So I, I tend to be more on the con conservative side with that one. And then usually I have this feeling like the market is not seeing it. The market is not pricing it in. I start doubting, am I wrong or not? But yeah, no, it just doesn't convince me then. But it's not the first thing I look at because otherwise there are like thousand and one considerations you can have because of the company specifics and such so I, I i prefer to keep a bit of simplicity in there yeah yeah i think sometimes keep it simple is is the best option here particularly as you said it's not an easy thing to find in the annual reports and then you have to estimate it as well which can can bring in obviously some some errors as well so i i don't i just stick to Stick to normal capex. Yeah. Um, Hobby investor has asked us, "What are your thoughts on ticker symbol CSL, which is Carlyle Companies, and ticker symbol SNA, which is Snap On, um, in a potential recession context like the current one?" Snap On for me is high on my list to buy around two hundred dollars if it ever gets there. I really would like to own the company. Uh, press time balance sheet uh, i like it yeah i mean Car carlyle companies i'm surprised you haven't heard of them they have an incredible 46 years of dividend growth and um, the dividend growth has been quite good they are they're quite diversified but they are in the construction industry roofing uh, roofing they do like some brakes and frictions there's fluid technologies they're in a wide range of different buildings and solutions um they've with stood the test of time um four four and a half decades worth of dividend increases so it's hard to bet against them uh, they're, they're a good company they have a strong balance sheet i think they'll be able to withstand another just depending on how, how severe but i think they'll be able to withstand it i don't know how much the dividend growth will be um mm -hmm. my only my only reason for these i remember glossing over these a while ago but their dividend yield is one point three one point four maybe even lower it's yeah. it's it's too low for my liking good um dividend growth investor who's your favorite friend from friends yeah this because i put a, a gift picture of uh, chandler on there uh, when i asked a question uh, for the show today and it was chandler a bit dancing or something like that and honestly joey joey is my favorite one he's the funny one of course always like a, a little bit more the stupid one as well um but i like him the most but if you look at my personality i'm probably a lot like chandler <laughs> yeah a bit crazy a bit uh, uh you know corporate so yeah um mine mine would be joey as well joey is as you said the, fu the funny one um so would have been joey um mario has asked us what do you think about ticker symbol b-a-l-l -L at the current level well it's uh hanging um you know around my raised uh, waist uh, was it wrist how do you call it about my hips yeah waist. and yeah and 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 over the years it has been sacking a bit down towards my knees <laughs> but uh yeah what, what do i feel it's better to ask my wife this question yeah so for those that don't know that don't know ball is ball corporation um ah it's a it's a company a company of course they are <laughs> <laughs> uh they are a packaging company they package beverages i i know a little bit about them because they do have a factory right next to where i work Um, i know they make the aluminum caps for you know, the coca-cola cans they don't make the whole cans they just make the caps here here where i'm from 
Um, but they're that's not the whole business. They have they have a whole host of it. Um, looking at their dividend history, it looks quite okay. Um, they've got seven years of consecutive annual increases, so they don't always increase it, but it looks like they've been paying a consistent dividend since 2004. There was probably one or two dividend cuts in there as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, I would expect them, if times get tough, to maybe cut their dividend again. So they're not on my radar, but... I, I, but I tell you, Mario is trying to prank us. I mean, come on, what do you think about Bull at current level? <laughs> come on, you know, the, the, this can't be a serious question. If you, if you look at them financially, they, they look... No, no, look at the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on, because this... <laughs> he's pranking us, I tell you. <laughs> Um, Casper has asked us, what is your op opinion on the Goiro announcing new fees from May 15th? Seems that buying US stocks would cost two euro per transaction. Uh, yeah, I, I, I noticed this as well. I mean, this is the issue with uh, low fee brokers. I think the hero is uh, having some troubles uh, sometimes with the financial watchdogs as well. Probably they just noticed that they need to boost up their cost structure. They've been acquired. The same happened with the Dutch uh, bank brokers at the time. Really great bank got acquired by Saxo. And uh, they promised like, ah, we will keep everything the same. And suddenly poof, maintenance fee introduced. Flatex buys it. Flatex is not doing so well. Boom. Um, you know, uh, second time already increasing the... The commissions and i think we see this with a lot of these companies that over time they come in like we're going to change the market uh, zero commissions and then once uh, at a certain moment there are investors that say like hey uh, guys we want the return now yeah and and this is what i see a lot with these uh there still the hero is, is really competitive pricing but by now interactive brokers is becoming i think one of the cheapest brokers available in europe yeah, interactive brokers is is far cheaper um, to buy at the moment, but you have to think of these companies. They have to make money, don't they? And the, the fees are very, very low. So, yeah. But I hope they in, reinvest a little bit in the hero and, and a bit the quality, um, also a bit more like uh, stop having this noise with the financial watchdog, right? Clean up your your kitchen and 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 give us a bit more trust again. Um, Dave S has asked me a question about two real estate investment trusts here in Ireland. I'm going to take that question next week because I want to give it a little bit more time. They are two companies. Um, I'm I'm vaguely familiar with them, but I will not do the question justice um, just by looking at them for five minutes. So I will definitely look at them because I'm, I'm quite interested in, in looking at REITs closer to home. Um, Dividend Yogi has asked us, he has 42 different stocks in his portfolio. What's your idea of the perfect number of holdings? How about you? How many are you holding? Uh, I'm, I'm having now 40 something, but 40 is perfect for me. But my allocation strategy is now 50 just because of the show blogging. I see so many great stocks that I had to give myself some more space, but ideally 40. Yeah. It fits really nicely with my tier, tier one to four strategy. My currently sits at 38 stocks. So yeah, it fits in with yeah. the, the 40, 40 tiering. Good. Hey, this is the end of the show. We had really many questions. Um, we respect each and every one of them. That's why I've been answering all of them. The show is a bit long. That's okay for us. I hope not for you. If it is getting too much, let us know. Uh, but then we need to start discriminating by you know having some policies in place that select certain questions and others not so uh, so far i think we are still at the edge of being able to to handle it but um that's it uh, derek for today this was show 144. we're getting closer to year three under our belt it's uh, been pretty incredible yeah. but again thanks to everyone for the questions we do appreciate them we do try and answer best we can um and those that we can't answer we will definitely answer and make shows sure, so. see you all later on
Remember, both of us at Dividend Talk are not certified financial specialists through formal education. We are just two guys sharing our journey for inspiration and entertainment purposes. Hence, this is not investment advice. Although we do our best, we can't promise that the information discussed is always correct, nor appropriate for you or anybody else. We always recommend that you do your own due diligence and be accountable for your own choices. As we always say, you can't borrow conviction from others. Last but not least, by listening to our podcast, you agree to hold us harmless from any ramifications, financial or otherwise, that occur to you as a result of acting on information provided in this podcast. Thank you.